Welcome back to Center Seat. Tonight we welcome Republican presidential candidate Dr. Ben Carson to our center seat. Let's bring in our panel. Steve Hayes, senior writer for the Weekly Standard. Ron Fournier, senior political columnist of National Journal and syndicated columnist Charles Krauthammer. Dr. Carson, thanks for being here. Uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you. Let me start with something you've been talking about. Uh, today, your potential opponent, Hillary Clinton, told the uh, New Hampshire Union leader uh, that she firmly defends Planned Parenthood, but she called these videos, these new videos, disturbing disturbing today and said there should be an investigation. Your reaction to that? Well, uh, that's one thing that I agree with her on, <laughs> that we definitely should be investigating this. Uh, for Planned uh, Parenthood also, I would ask that maybe uh, Ms. Clinton would go back and look at their history and uh, look at the history of the person who was the major founder, Margaret Sanger, who she says she admires who was a racist uh, and believed in eugenics. And, uh, you know, go back and look at many of her quotations. It's really quite disturbing that anybody would find someone like that a heroic figure. But more importantly, what's going on here is we as a society have allowed our sensitivities to gradually be dulled to the point where it takes something of this magnitude to begin to shock us when all along babies were being slaughtered. And the relationship, one of the most sacred relationships that exists, that between a mother and a developing child, has been distorted to the point where we have many women believe that that's an inconvenience for them, and that that child is their enemy, and that that child can be destroyed, and that anybody who doesn't agree with that is engaged in a war on women. So I assume that you're fully behind the effort to defund Planned Parenthood. They come back and say there are other things that that organization does, cancer screenings, women's health. Uh, they list a whole bunch of things. Not, not, not only am I fully behind it, uh, I encourage people to sign our petition on bencarson.com to defund it. Um, you know, all of those things that they say that they do otherwise, uh, mammograms and, and screenings and HIV testing, et cetera, aren't those the things that were supposed to be taken care of by Obamacare? Uh, and there are many other mechanisms to get those things taken care of. So I think it's just a screen. And we, again, I keep pointing people to the fact that babies, human beings, are not just a needless pile of cells, as they would have you believe. They have to dehumanize it in order to justify what they're doing. Steve. Um, speaking of Obamacare, one subject that will surely be part of the debate next week is Medicaid. Some of your rivals, as governor, chose to expand it under Obamacare. Others rejected that option. I'm interested in your views generally on whether it was a good idea to expand Medicaid or not. And secondly, is it your experience, what's your experience in terms of the care that patients get who are on Medicaid? Is it necessarily the case that they get better outcomes if they're on Medicaid? Uh, no, they don't necessarily get better care. Here, and many practitioners uh, don't necessarily accept patients who are on Medicaid. I could give you some shocking names of some Democrats who, who try to act like they're wonderful people and, and don't want to deal with well, it. You're welcome to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to ask him questions about that. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, uh, the bottom line is we really need to start thinking about how do we take care of people in a reasonable way? Uh, how do we take practitioners out of a position where, you know, they have to decide upon the viability of their practice and therefore they can only take a certain number of those kinds of patients. We don't want them in that position. And, and that's why, you know, I have tended to look for a better system. Uh, is health care a right? I don't believe it is, but I do believe it is a responsibility for a compassionate society, which we are. And, and that's why I've advocated the use of health savings accounts. Uh, make them available to everybody. We can pay for them with the same dollars that we pay for traditional care with. We give people the flexibility to move money around in their HSA, within their family. It gives you enormous flexibility to cover almost anything that comes up. Cause makes the cost of catastrophic insurance go down dramatically because the only thing coming out of it is catastrophic health care. Um, and 
that will easily take care of the majority of people in this country for less money than we're paying now. But what about the indigent? And, and you know, this is where you know Medicaid and things of that come in. That's how we take care of them now, Medicaid. But the annual Medicaid budget is four to five hundred billion dollars a year. Uh, think about the fact that there are a quarter of our people involved in that. Eighty million, eighty million to four hundred billion goes five thousand times five thousand dollars each man, woman, and child. What could you buy with that? A concierge practice, and still have money left over over the buy your catastrophic insurance. I'm not s suggesting we do that, but that's what's available. If we do that in a practical way, uh, give them the ability uh, to have control of their HSA, which people in government will say you can't do because they're stupid and they can't do it. But they said that about food stamps, too. It's not true. Um, and they will learn how to use it. They'll learn very quickly not to go to the emergency room where, where it costs five times more than to go to the clinic. And in the clinic, you're also going to be looking at their overall health, and you're going to be teaching them the whole concept of health management for themselves. And we want to teach people how to be responsible and not how to be dependent. Ron. Sir, uh, you and I grew up in the same town of Detroit about the same time. I grew up in the northeast side, raised by a Detroit riot cop. Yes. Uh, my family and my neighborhood was part of white flight in the 70s and 80s. Right. You grew up in the southwest side. Um, mother was a housekeeper. Um, you grew up near the riots. Right. Can you talk a little bit about our city, um, our different experiences, our two Americas, yes. and how that might um, uh, reflect the way you would lead uh, this country? Yeah. Well, you know, Detroit is a great example of what the United States is going to experience if they don't learn from what Detroit did. Um, you know, basically Detroit kept kicking the can down the road, being fiscally irresponsible, not caring about the next generation, um, allowing uh, bad relationships to fester and feeding them, and uh, it blew up. It was once the most prosperous city in America. Some people say the most prosperous city in the world. And from there, we go to the largest bankruptcy in our country. And uh, I think there are many things to be learned. One of the things that uh, is that we cannot allow the purveyors of division to prevail and to, to drive wedges between us in every possible way, race, religion, gender, income, age, everything possible. Politics? Politics, everything. Um, the other thing is we must be fiscally responsible. Uh, Detroit was not fiscally responsible. And some people say it was the unions, the unions, the unions. But no, the unions couldn't have done what they did without cooperation from all of those executives right. in the automobile industry who knew that they would have their golden parachute and be long gone before the effects hit. And if, if, if we only worry about ourselves and we don't worry about those coming behind us, that is inevitable. Sounds like D.C., doesn't it? It really does. Let me uh, wrap this first segment there. We'll have two more with Dr. Carr more with Center Seat and Charles Krauthammer's question after the break.